or describe the Apollo 13 moon mission this way. Apollo 13 was the third attempt to land humans on the moon and the first to fail. 56 hours into the mission with the crew, when the crew was more than 200,000 miles from Earth, an explosion within the Apollo service module's oxygen tank disabled the primary spacecraft, forcing the crew to shelter in the attached lunar module. Unable to land, the crew of the Apollo 13 changed their course rapidly, slung to, uh, too rapidly slingshot around the moon and returned to Earth. Three days after the accident, the astronauts safely re-entered Earth's atmosphere uh, and splashed down in the Pacific Ocean. Despite the flagging interest in Apollo program at the time, the so-called successful failure of Apollo 13 engaged worldwide interest demonstrated the capability of the crew and mission support teams and came to represent a defining moment in NASA history. And as most of you know uh, by now, Apollo 13 obviously became a 1995 uh, American movie hit, a docudrama. It was uh, directed by Ron Howard, and it starred uh, Tom Hanks, Kevin Bacon, Bill Paxton, Ed Harris and Gary Sinise and, of course, others. The late Bill Paxton played Apollo astronaut Fred Hayes in the movie. By the way, Fred Hayes wrote a terrific book about his life and Apollo 13 experience called Never Panic Early. And uh, he wrote that with Bill Moore. Uh, it is my pleasure to, rep to, uh, to invite and to introduce my friend, Biloxi and Fred Hayes to coach for you today. We're going we're gonna to talk for the full hour. Good morning, Fred. Oh, good morning. Glad to be with you today. Well, one of the things that, that uh, Fred Hayes and I talked about before we started the show was that he's going to be 89 in November. And uh, when I did my research on him uh, and seen and, and watched uh, some recent interviews with him, he, he, he has stayed really sharp. He's a smart man who's on top of his games, has a good uh, grasp of the history. But uh, what did you say to me before we started the show about not never stopping? Well, my mother always said, when you retire, never sit too long in your rocking chair. <laughs> well, you, you certainly haven't done that. You have uh, you participate still in the education of children around the world. We'll talk a little bit about that when we get, when we get uh, into that part of the conversation. But listen, before we go too far, you were honored earlier this year with a statue at uh, Lighthouse Park in Biloxi. Now, you've been honored all around the world, as you well know and as we know. But that had to be super special to you to see what Biloxi did for you. It, it was. It's kind of embarrassing because obviously I'm not the only uh, Biloxi and made good uh, over the years. Uh, and I guess it fit. It kind of fit the, uh, the statue that was already in place as an explorer uh, that uh, Diabville has the other statue. And uh, of course, I was an explorer of a different sort uh, going to the moon. So it maybe maybe fit that uh, that with the placement where it was by the lighthouse and nearby the Diabeville statue. Well, you uh, you were born in Biloxi. You grew up in Biloxi. Um, the, the part that, that of, of your story that really, interestingly, it kind of connects to, to my story is the fact that you were a, a carrier for the Daily Herald. And... Um, uh, um, of course, I was publisher of the Sun Herald. Daily Herald, for people who are new to this community, don't know the Daily Herald was the uh, was when the Sun, which was the morning newspaper, and the Daily Herald came together and formed the Sun Herald in 1985. Uh, but the uh, but the Daily Herald was actually owned by the Wilkes family. From uh, the the paper started in 1910, it uh, it merged in 1985, as I mentioned. Of course, the Sun Herald went on to be owned by State Record Company, Knight Ritter, and the McClatchy Company. Um, but anyway, uh, Fred, you were you were a carrier for uh, for the newspaper, and you got to know the Wilkes family really well. You were a Boy Scout. Uh, the Wilkes started Camp Wilkes here in, in uh, on the North Shore of Biloxi Bay. That that's a that's a really important part of your life, isn't it? Uh, yes, it was. Uh, Mr. E. E. P. Wilkes actually was my scoutmaster in Troop Two Twelve, and uh, but he also obviously uh, ran the newspaper. Uh, I was uh, had Route Sixteen, which uh, pretty much covered the central part from Howard Avenue to the beach. And uh, had a, had a, about 170 papers. 
Uh, several I delivered to several hotels on the beach that were existing in all, all wooden structures. And unfortunately, uh, the 47 hurricane wiped out about half my route overnight because uh, it rolled everything up from the beachfront about a half a block up the street. Uh, I think one restaurant uh, remained, it was center block and it stayed uh, up and that's about the only structure that was along the coast, uh, along that central part of Biloxi that survived. And uh, it was a, it was a, really a good experience because the way they set it up, you were your own little businessman. Uh, I bought the papers each week from the Bloxy Gulfport Daily Herald, uh, two cents a paper, delivered six days. So uh, I had to pay the newspaper 12 cents. And uh, then I earned eight cents when I collected. So I had eight cents earned on... Uh, 170 papers. So I was actually doing pretty well for my eight. I was 12 years old when I started as a paper boy. So that was a that for me. That was a lot of money at that uh, day and age. So really, really important. You, by the way, <clears throat> back in those days, there wasn't a Sunday newspaper. So uh, the, the the paper that people read was was either the Mobile uh, Register or the Times Picayune, and I had the pleasure of being president and publisher of both of those newspapers but you know the coast is kind of connected together isn't it uh and back in those days that you know it was people really paid attention to what was happening regionally weren't they yes there were yeah yeah black the coast is a, a series of uh, cities strung out uh, from bay st louis over to uh, moss point and uh each in a way is their own domain and uh but otherwise, uh, the, the, the business at hand, particularly tourism, kind of connects them all. Yeah. So you, uh, you had the opportunity to work with the Wilkes um, on Boy Scouts. So when, uh, when the Wilkes created this wonderful Camp Wilkes on the northern shore of Biloxi Bay, you weren't surprised by that, were you? Uh, no, I actually didn't know the particulars of how that, that property, uh, that I didn't realize it at the time, that was uh, Mr. Wilkes' property. And, um, of course, I enjoyed it uh, through camperies and Boy Scout activities. Uh, we, we held at uh, Camp Week Wilkes that I, I was a part of with uh, our troop, uh, as well as others, uh, 213 and others that existed along the coast that took part in. Yeah, so your newspaper, your newspaper story uh, doesn't actually stop there. Um, lots more connections. You actually uh, did some journalism at Bluxy High. You went to Mississippi Gulf Coast Community College, the Perk Campus, and uh, you were interested in journalism. I, I love the part where you got to know Jack Nelson, uh, the famed Pulitzer Prize winning uh, journalist from Los Angeles, who from the Los Angeles Times, who was uh, 21 years at the Washington Bureau. And someone we at the Sun Herald were incredibly proud of. Jack was a special, special journalist, wasn't he? Yes, he was. Uh, he was. Uh, he got a nickname of Scoop. And uh, when I was at Perkinson Junior College, now Mississippi Gulf Coast, uh, in the summers, uh, Cosman Eisendraft uh, let me work at uh, as, as a reporter, and I was uh, then then known by uh, the police and others as Scoop Junior. And it was interesting <laughs> times. Uh, sometimes I even got to ride in a police car. Wow. would be kind of unheard of today. And uh, so I, I normally got what, uh, in sports activity, I got what Jack didn't want to cover. In other words, I got a lot of junior high games and uh, peewee games, uh, those sorts of things. Cause, and occasionally he'd have something that he couldn't cover the high school, and I'd get to cover that game. But the way Cosman did it one summer, he gave me the, uh, I call it more feature writing activity, covering conventions and uh, that sort of thing. And then another summer, he gave me the uh, courts and police beat and uh, just for, for variety. And he was, a, he was a Bluxy City editor at the time, Cosman. Yeah. So I, it was a good experience. And I was set to continue my life career in journalism uh, with the exception of the deviation I had uh, serving my country uh, with the Korean War. So we'll, we'll actually pick it up there when we come back. And one other, one other point, Jack Nelson, the Pulitzer Prize winning journalist you were just talking about that you had the opportunity to work with, 
He, his, his nickname was Scoop because he was an aggressive reporter. And this is sort of a new angle to the story. I didn't realize that people <laughs> had come to know you as Scoop Jr. What a great connection to journalism to have that, that connection with Jack Nelson. Hey, when we come back, we'll continue on with uh, his decision during the Korean War to go to Naval Aviation Cadet Program. And uh, it took him to Pensacola and to Texas and jet training in North Carolina. We're going to go through all that. We'll see you after this break. Hey, guess what? Bob is back. Now at 106.3, playing the 80s, 90s, and whatever. Check us out. The new Bob 106.3. When it comes to the outdoors, we are one. We live in one of the best places in America to enjoy the great outdoors. So let's talk about it. Super Talk Outdoors with Ricky Matthews. Monday starting at noon here on Super Talk Mississippi. Presented by the Foundation Protecting Our Outdoors Heritage. Listen or watch the show anywhere you get Super Talk Mississippi. If Alexa's part of your life, you've got one more way to access Super Talk. Super Talk Mississippi is now available on Amazon Alexa devices. Once enabled, just say Alexa Play Super Talk Mississippi at any time and start listening. It's that easy. Just one more way to stay informed and connected with your state. Learn more at supertalk.fm slash Alexa. Super Talk Mississippi. Super Talk Mississippi. Now available on Amazon Alexa devices. Get the news that matters to Mississippi on Middays with Gerard Gibbert. Middays with Gerard Gibbert. Each weekday starting at 10 a.m., Gerard brings you a spirited debate on the key stories of the day with the newsmakers and powerful reporting on the issues you care about. Listen on your local Super Talk station or anywhere you get Super Talk Mississippi and watch the show live on C Spire Channel 70, Super Talk TV, and on the Super Talk Mississippi app. Gardening is one of the most popular hobbies in America, with the average gardener spending five hours a week in the garden. In Mississippi, keeping a healthy, beautiful garden is practically an obsession. But if you have questions about gardening, there's no better person to answer them than the garden mama, Nellie Neal. So whether it's gardening basics or troubles for the more experienced gardeners out there, the garden mama has the answers for you. Saturday morning, starting at 8 on Super Talk Mississippi and Super Talk TV. Feeling down? Here's your prescription for a daily dose of good news and positive vibes. Good Things with Rebecca Turner. Every afternoon, Rebecca highlights all the good things happening right here in the state you call home. Daily exposure to good things with Rebecca Turner may cause smiling, feelings of positivity, happiness, and even laughter. When you experience these symptoms, tell your friends to listen. Okay. Weekdays starting at 2 p.m. here on Super Talk Mississippi and now on Amazon Alexa devices. Hey, guess what? Bob is back. Now at 106.3, playing the 80s, 90s, and whatever. Check us out. The new Bob 106.3. His love for the coast is why he's here. It's Coast View with Ricky Matthews on Super Talk Mississippi Gulf Coast 103.1. Welcome back to Coast View. Today is a very, very special program. I'm having the opportunity to, to visit with Fred Hayes, the Apollo 13 astronaut. Uh, movies have been made about him. And, uh, you know, he, he had that point of his life, but he went on to just make con contributions beyond that, uh, not only to space, but just in general to, to humanity. And he continues to make contributions today, at, you know, soon to be 89 years old. And you certainly can't tell it when we're having these conversations, that's for sure. Um, so the Korean War happens, and uh, it sort of began to unlock a, a direction for your life, Fred, that eventually took you to, uh, uh, to the University of Oklahoma and Oklahoma National Guard. But let's just kind of retrace some of those steps. Well, uh, the, the first deviation was uh, uh, with the advent of the Korean War. When I finished two years at uh, Perkinson Junior College, I uh, had hoped to go to the University of Missouri, which was a very renowned school in journalism to continue uh, my degree plan. 
but I really didn't have the the funding uh, and uh, I, I know, enough grades to get a good scholarship. So I decided to join up and serve my country and uh, went into the Naval Aviation Cadet Program, became a, a pilot uh, in, in uh, ultimately when I graduated into the Marine Corps and uh, served in two uh, Marine fighter squadrons uh, before I, I left the Marine Corps. Uh, I did not see combat, uh, but the time I finished flight training, uh, the armistice had been signed uh, some six, eight months before that time. Uh, and uh, after that, I thought about what I wanted to do next, and uh, I loved aviation. And that, I, clearly I knew it's when I first started flying that this was now going to be a career. So, somehow my career was going to be in aviation. The uh, space program had not arisen yet, so that wasn't a possibility. But uh, I decided to become a test pilot, and I knew uh, to do that, uh, I would need an engineering degree. It's sort of a requirement uh, in that business. So that's when I went back to school at the University of Oklahoma. And from that, uh, my squadron commander actually recommended I apply to NACA, uh, which was aircraft, primarily aircraft research and testing uh, agency at the time, before it became NASA. Uh, by the time I graduated, though, in 59, it had become NASA, and I applied and uh, was accepted to join the pilot's office, uh, research pilot's office at Lewis Research Center in Cleveland, Ohio. That was, so that was my first uh, first job uh, with NASA in 1959, and one year after it became NASA. Yeah, it was interesting <laughs> in your story <clears throat> when when you were considering whether you wanted to become an astronaut or not, because at the time pilots wanted to fly. I mean, you, you were, you, you enjoyed flying, you were a test pilot, you were involved in so many different aspects in that way. But Neil Armstrong gave you some advice along the way. It could have actually deterred you or dissuaded you, couldn't it have? It, it, well, it made it very difficult to uh, decide to apply. Uh, I had moved from Lewis Research Center to uh, Flight Research Center Again, following Neil, about three years behind Neil, because uh, he had been there and he had got to fly the X-15, which unfortunately I didn't. Uh, he had moved on to uh, and and was fl had fl flown in the Gemini program, was fixing to fly in the Gemini program, and came back to visit. And uh, uh, Don Malik and I sat with him uh, as he came to Flight Research Center and said, "What's it like being an astronaut?" And Neil uh, slowly uh, thought a minute and said, well, you sit in a lot of meetings, sit in a simulator a lot, and you don't get much good flying. <laughs> he was relating to his experience as I was enjoying at Flight Research Center. I was, in any given month, I was flying, you know, something like four to six different types of airplanes that'd be involved in three different test programs, uh, maybe as the primary pilot at one. and." as a secondary uh, a support pilot and another, and, and also has had a lot of uh, flights uh, supporting X-15 uh, flights, preparing w weather flights the morning of the launch, uh, checking the lake beds ahead of the launch, that kind of thing. And so I was flying, you know, literally almost every day in some aircraft or the other, sometimes twice a day. So it, I had to think hard about should I go, uh, uh, as Neil said, go to Johnson Space Center at Man, Man Space Script Center, it was at the time, and sit in a lot of meetings and sit in simulators a lot. So I finally decided, well, the Apollo had come along, and I knew if I stayed at Edwards, I had no chance of going to the moon, which sounded like a great adventure. So that's what uh, made me finally put my application in, and of course was accepted uh, that year in 1966. Yeah, it's a, it's amazing. You know, looking back, it's almost like divine intervention in a way. When you think about the work that you did, <clears throat> the early work that you did on the lunar module, and then the way that Apollo thirteen sort of played out, um, how often do you think about that? That you 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 really became a lunar module expert. Uh, well, I and I and Ed Mitchell, we were the two uh, that got our first uh, what to call support uh, support crew assignments. Uh, we were assigned under Jim McDivitt, who was slated to fly the first limb in orbit. And uh, he, he, we met with uh, Jim and uh, for instructions, and he just said, I want you to go to Grumman and make sure I have a good limb to fly. So Ed and I spent almost the next year up there, and really not just testing limb three, 
uh, from limb two through limb six, I was in those vehicles the first time we put power to the vehicles. And through all the uh, testing, that we got, got, got them through to be ready to ship to uh, Kennedy Space Center. So, uh, yeah. yeah, by Ed, Ed and I did become very proficient in understanding all the, the systems and how they work uh, in the lunar module, even, even beyond what you would normally need to fly the vehicle. You know this this plays out throughout the Apollo 13 story and certainly the Apollo the Apollo uh, mission. The the fact that you guys did not have a lot of the current technology, computers, uh, handheld calculators. Um, uh, I mean, I, I, do you look back on it and and think, my gosh? I mean, you, just just thinking about the design of the lunar module and how it worked and the science and technology and and math requirements that were behind all of that. Does it blow your mind looking back on that, that you guys were able to accomplish what you were able to accomplish? Uh, certainly now, now that what we have in house used today, but uh, at the time, uh, uh, what we had was pretty incredible. Uh, the little, the little hand-wired uh, computer we had in both the command module and the lunar module constituted about one tenth of a megabyte of memory one-tenth of a megabyte. And uh, so we, we obviously had to limit uh, what the computer was, how it was used, and primarily it was used for guidance, navigation, and control of the vehicle. That's the things it could do. Every other system in the vehicle, we just operated manually with various switches and knobs and things because uh, there was not the capacity in the computer. As things are interlinked today, not just in flying vehicles, but even in your automobile uh, to do things. Uh, so that capability hadn't come along yet. But as I said, uh, not knowing what was going to come in, uh, that, seemed, that seemed pretty incredible. It, it was the first uh, digital world, because everything computer-wise had been analog up to that point. Uh, so no, it, uh, it's, it was amazing uh, to us to be able to do what we did with what we had at the time. Did, did you have to pinch yourself in the moment to say that you're actually here making this kind of contribution, learning these kinds of things? Was it a dream come true? Sort of what was your mindset in those moments? Well, again, I, my mindset was as a test pilot. So I was, uh, I was enjoying several aspects of just the design development of a new flying machine, even though it was uh, kind of a strange flying machine compared to most airplanes. But uh, so that was exciting to me, uh, aside from thinking that now I was going to get to fly the machine. Uh, <laughs> so that I, I was, uh, I didn't think of going to the moon, frankly, I'll have to say as uh, I knew it would be as a difficult task, a big challenge. But if you think of it in the big picture, I knew we weren't going very far. I mean, it's a sense of even the solar system much less the universe at large. So, but it was kind of a baby step, uh, if you will, in uh, exploration beyond our own planet, which was exciting and just in, from that fact. Yeah, uh, there, there is absolutely no doubt about that. I mentioned to you when we were off the air that you had the opportunity, you know, certainly throughout your career, to be around some really, really smart and innovative people. You know, in those early days in the Apollo program, who were some people that just stuck out to you as just literally off the charts smart? Well, obviously, in, in the Apollo program, uh, I was more closely able to observe in uh, meetings called engineering change boards, those sorts of things. Uh, Bob Gilruth, who was the, uh, at that time, had been at NASA Langley uh, Research Center as a, a research engineer and was at that time head of Manned Spacecraft Center. Uh, he and, of course, uh, Chris Kraft, who was kind of the uh, founder of Mission Control and uh, how, how it uh, really was behind every flight from Mercury forward. And, uh, and the program manager that came in after the fire that uh, we killed the crew in the pad to uh, pull the program back together, George Lowe. Uh, George Lowe was a, an incredible uh, manager of activity following that. I, I was sat in several of those meetings uh, try, as we tried to recover from that uh, with an enormous amount, obviously, of change traffic coming through with the redesigns in several ways, not just the hat, new hatch design on the, on the capsule, but also wiring and other things that, that went on with systems. 
So he was a he was an incredible leader. We headquarters had good people too, although I didn't know them as well. Uh, Matthews was one, and General Phillips had the yes. Yeah. So let's do. We'll pick it up on the other side. We're having a conversation with uh, Apollo 13 astronaut Fred Hayes from Biloxi, and uh, we'll we'll uh, continue the conversation on the other side. We'll see you after this break. Listen live or on demand and watch episodes of Coast View on your laptop, desktop, or on your phone or tablet by going to supertalkmsgulfcoast.com. When it comes to the outdoors, we are one. We live in one of the best places in America to enjoy the great outdoors. So let's talk about it. Super Talk Outdoors with Ricky Matthews. Monday starting at noon here on Super Talk Mississippi. Presented by the Foundation Protecting Our Outdoors Heritage. Listen or watch the show anywhere you get Super Talk Mississippi. Feeling down? Here's your prescription for a daily dose of good news and positive vibes. Good Things with Rebecca Turner. Every afternoon, Rebecca highlights all the good things happening right here in the state you call home. Daily exposure to good things with Rebecca Turner may cause smiling, feelings of positivity, happiness, and even laughter. When you experience these symptoms, tell your friends to listen. Okay. Weekdays starting at 2 p.m. here on Super Talk Mississippi and now on Amazon Alexa devices. These are our friends. These are our neighbors. We all have the power to grow our local economy and energize our community. Shop small businesses and make a difference. Get the news that matters to Mississippi on Middays with Gerard Gibbert. Middays with Gerard Gibbert. Each weekday starting at 10 a.m., Gerard brings you a spirited debate on the key stories of the day with the newsmakers and powerful reporting on the issues you care about. Listen on your local Super Talk station or anywhere you get Super Talk Mississippi. And watch the show live on Seaspire Channel 70, Super Talk TV, and on the Super Talk Mississippi app. Gardening is one of the most popular hobbies in America, with the average gardener spending five hours a week in the garden. In Mississippi, keeping a healthy, beautiful garden is practically an obsession. But if you have questions about gardening, there's no better person to answer them than the garden mama, Nellie Neal. So whether it's gardening basics or troubles for the more experienced gardeners out there, the garden mama has the answers for you. Saturday morning, starting at 8 on Super Talk Mississippi and Super Talk TV. For something new and unique in talk radio, take a listen to The Ben Shapiro Show. Every day we're driving the debate in America with the fastest moving, hardest hitting, most comprehensive fact-based commentary on the radio. We don't hold back, we never shy away from telling you the truth. Our show is a meeting place of ideas. We have the most important guests and the biggest thinkers in America. Weeknights at nine. For something new and unique in talk radio, take a listen to The Ben Shapiro Show. On Super Talk Mississippi. You know that nowadays, most people go online to look at a business before they spend their money. Are customers able to find you online? With the power of Super Talk Mississippi Media Digital, you can reach potential customers and get more referral and repeat business. Super Talk Mississippi Media Digital's highly trained and trusted staff is ready to work with you to help your business capitalize on the power of digital marketing. Call 601-991-2305 or go to stmmdigital.com to get started today. Super Talk Mississippi. Just, just seems to me people have so much invested in not telling the truth. When you want the truth. Simply because it might hurt some feelings. And nothing but the truth. Lose some subscribers. You want the Gallo Radio Show. I just think in this audience, you still believe that if you tell the truth, you come out ahead. The Gallo Radio Show. And if you tell yourself otherwise, you're lying to yourself. Mornings on Super Talk Mississippi. We're one Mississippi where there's a magnolia tree. Two Mississippi while a mockingbird sings out on its limb. 
He's the former president and publisher of the Sun Herald, and now he's on the radio. Welcome to Coast View with Ricky Matthews on Super Talk Mississippi Gulf Coast 103.1. Welcome back to Coast View. I'm honored today to have Fred Hayes, the Apollo 13 astronaut that has made so many incredible contributions to humanity, really over his lifetime, be 89 in November, which is amazing. We recently honored him with a statue at uh, Lighthouse Park in Biloxi. It's terrific. If you haven't seen the statue, incidentally, you should go by and take a look at it. It's really, really special. And, uh, you know, as he pointed out, there there have been a lot of Biloxians who have gone off to do some amazing things. But uh, as I pointed out to him, I don't think anyone more significant uh, and probably not what more well known than than Fred Hayes as a result of his uh, Apollo 13 uh, and NASA experience. That that is for sure. Hey, when we went to break, we you were you were just sharing some people that you came in contact with along the way that really impacted you, and you know just really smart people. Um, in terms of the astronaut pool, who, who stood out to you as someone that you, you just were super impressed by? I'm sure all of them, but, I, but is, you know, what, is there a name that sticks out? Well, it, obviously, uh, the, my commander, Jim Lovell. <clears throat> but <clears throat> you have to understand, the astronaut group as a whole is not uh, as tightly knit as most people think. It's not... Like I was uh, closer to a group uh, environment was my squadrons in the military, where yeah. you're with the people every day. You flew with most of the people in the squadron over a month. Uh, in the astronaut office, you got closest with those who you were assigned to a mission with, and the reason is when, once you were assigned a mission, <clears throat> you weren't in the office very much. You were off training. Uh, our, tr- our primary trainers were at Kennedy. Uh, the vehicle testing you did was either at the factory where they were being built or after they were shipped to Kennedy. And you're out on geology field trips all over the place. So you didn't spend a lot of time back through Houston, uh, where really the only activity there was some water tank work for the uh, splashdown and post splashdown type activity. And once we even went out in the Gulf with a boilerplate. Uh, to get uh, post splashdown uh, activity uh, tested there, or not tested, but trained. So there wasn't much time at Houston. So uh, you were intimately involved with both the prime and the backup crew and the support crew that were assigned to the mission you were on at the time. Uh, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt you. What's that? No, I, 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 didn't, I thought I interrupted you. I'm sorry. Uh, but no, I, I'd say that the uh, Apollo yeah. 8, I got very close to Neil and Buzz because on Apollo 8, we were the backup crew. Yes. For Apollo 8. Uh, then, of course, I had another assignment with, uh, with them where I was the, still the backup. I had to cycle another time, and I backed up Buzz Aldrin uh, on that mission for their uh, first mission to land on the moon. But I had that, Jim was a commander on that backup uh, course, and then he w- we cycled to 13. So uh, I, I served two times with uh, Jim Lovell and Ken Manningly in training. Well, you have, uh, you have uh, I mean, the real historical perspective and having worked so closely with Neil Armstrong, the, the man, first man on the moon. When he made that first step, how proud were you? Well, I was I was proud not not just of Neil, but of the program and that we had uh, made the date. Uh, the the president had uh, given NASA as a goal, and uh, that everything worked, uh, even though it had a glitch uh, approaching landing. 
but worked uh, through that even to successfully make the landing. Uh, so no, I was, I was everyone involved was uh, felt uh, terrific and having accomplished what was uh, set out for us to do. And overall, together as a team, we had made it happen. Well, you and I talked a little bit about your book, Never Panic Early. Um, and I've seen these interviews with you where you talk about after the explosion occurred on Apollo 13, you immediately made your way back to what you called the couch and started to look at the instruments and read them and understand sort of what the problem was. Um, you know, you're, certainly that experience uh, is the basis for Never Panic Early, but the, but the learnings really apply to life. And uh, why don't you talk a little bit about that and why that was important to you to make sure people saw that that one learning as being one of the most significant ways to sort of get through adversity. Well, that, you know, obviously I'd experienced uh, things in airplanes, I had en engine failures, uh, I had fire warning lights, uh, once actually a small fire in the afterburner section of an airplane. Uh, so I then had incidents like that uh, occur where you had to figure out what your best workaround was. Uh, leading uh, up in years before I became an astronaut. Uh, even one, one lifetime thing, I, 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 I didn't include it in the book because it happened after I'd, the book was published. <clears throat> but I was driving back from Biloxi <clears throat> along Interstate 10 one night late. Uh, in fact, it was after the event of the, uh, the statue uh, unveiling. And uh, late at night, about 9 o'clock at night along I-10 with my granddaughter next to me in the car, and in the middle of nowhere in Louisiana, she suffered a grand mal seizure next to me with her arms and legs flailing and head back breathing heavily. And it was now to figure out, well, should I pull over? You know, the options, so to pull over and stop and uh, call for an ambulance, 911. And now I'd have to wait for the ambulance to get there. So I quickly, the other option was keep going, which I decided to do to the next exit. And uh, at the Cal Calcasieu, Louisiana, I remember forever, only a filling station. But the lady advised me to go backwards to uh, Jennings, where there was a hospital nearest I-10. And I did call 911 and had a sheriff meet me to escort me and got her to the hospital. So that was one of those uh, <laughs> never panic early uh, uh, times uh, to get, get her uh, straightened out and, and to the hospital. So but in your book, in your book, you, you it, it is it really is an important life lesson. As you pointed out, you have many of them prior to and after that that harrowing moment. Uh, but uh, the pinnacle never panic early was what was happening when you were looking at those instruments after the explosion, wasn't it? Well, it, it, the, the, the emotions were a disappointment because uh, what I saw was uh, with some confusion of the number of warning lights on across different systems, which was unexpected and unexplained because systems, as I said, were all mechanical other than the computer, what it did. Uh, no reason for one system to affect another system. But mainly one oxygen tank I knew was gone. So that was an abort without reference and mission rules. And I lost the chance to land, I knew. So that was... It was not life-threatening, though, because it appeared uh, that the second tank was intact. It had, unfortunately, it had a very slow leak. And we had troubleshooting uh, then with Mission Control for about an hour, trying different schemes of uh, opening and closing valves to try to isolate that leak before it really, at about 50 minutes, uh, it became pretty certain we'd run out of ideas and uh, we we're going to lose the mothership. So that's when uh, Jim and I, Jim Lovell and I got very busy then to get the limb powered up so we'd have something to uh, continue communication and hold attitudes and eventually hopefully work our way back home. Do you think that you know, it's interesting because a lot of people, you know, current in this moment, because the movie has been shown so many times and still plays today and people are reintroduced to uh, this experience over and over and over again. Do you think the movie did a good job of explaining the, all the gyrations that had to happen to try to figure out how to give you guys the time you needed to get home? Uh, 
Well, they they obviously did a good job of the overall story of the uh, we were in trouble and there was a team that worked to get us home. Although they didn't show the number of players actually involved, there was a much larger team that was called on in some brain trust from even back to manufacturers that had actually designed and built the spacecraft uh, to get involved with some of these workarounds or consulted at least. Uh, so that was a little shortcoming in the movie, but it did tell the big picture story, of, as I said, of uh, people with a challenge and trouble, deep trouble, and a team pulling together to have a ho happy Hollywood ending. Uh, they added, that, they didn't cover all the kind of challenges that had to be addressed. They kind of picked the ones that they knew would show well in media. Yeah. And uh, some of the things we did were, in a way, uh, just as complicated as the ones they showed. But would not have uh, been been harder, as Ron said, hard to explain in, in a movie. Yeah, you actually you actually talked about a conversation you had with Ron Howard along the way, where he had to sort of break it to you that it's a two-hour movie and no way to get into those complexities. But um, but he really absorbed himself in the experience and tried to do his best to to tell the story and get, got a lot of kudos for that, didn't he? Yes, he did. I, I think he was pushed a lot too by Tom Hanks, who was a as a great space fan uh, of the, of, at least of the actor Cadre that was involved in the film, he 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 knew he knew more about what was going on in the space shuttle than I knew at the time, and uh, so I think he pushed uh, Ron and and I think pushed to get the zero G airplane uh, and uh, to have some of the scenes actually with the actors free floating in the airplane for some of the scenes that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, that's that's so interesting, and it's uh, it's so sad that Bill Paxton, who who played you in the movie, passed away. Uh, when we come back from break, I'm curious if you guys developed a relationship along the way, and we'll talk more about um, how how it's been to be an Apollo 13 astronaut for throughout his life, and what what opportunities has that created for him to continue to make contributions back to humanity. We'll see you after this break. Subscribe for free to the Coast View Podcast on iTunes, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. You know that nowadays, most people go online to look at a business before they spend their money. Are customers able to find you online? With the power of Super Talk Mississippi Media Digital, you can reach potential customers and get more referral and repeat business. Super Talk Mississippi Media Digital's highly trained and trusted staff is ready to work with you to help your business capitalize on the power of digital marketing. Call 601-991-2305 or go to stmmdigital.com to get started today. Get the news that matters to Mississippi on Middays with Gerard Gibbert. Middays with Gerard Gibbert. Each weekday starting at 10 a.m., Gerard brings you a spirited debate on the key stories of the day with the newsmakers and powerful reporting on the issues you care about. Listen on your local Super Talk station or anywhere you get Super Talk Mississippi. And watch the show live on Ceasefire Channel 70, Super Talk TV, and on the Super Talk Mississippi app. Whether you're brand new to the DIY craze or a seasoned veteran, The Handyman Show has something for you. Buddy Slowick shares tips and tricks on everything from odd jobs to complete build-outs, from small home repairs to serious construction. So no matter if you're at the master carpenter level or not quite sure how to use a level, The Handyman Show answers your questions with a healthy dose of humor and some great music, too. Saturdays, 10 to noon on Super Talk Mississippi and on Super Talk TV. Super Talk Mississippi. Just, just seems to me people have so much invested in not telling the truth. When you want the truth. Simply because it might hurt some feelings. And nothing but the truth. Lose some subscribers. You want the Gallo Radio Show. I just think in this audience you still believe that if you tell the truth you come out ahead. The Gallo Radio Show. And if you tell yourself otherwise, you're lying to yourself. Mornings on Super Talk Mississippi. Hey, I'm Steve Azar, and you never know who or what you'll hear when I spend a Mississippi minute with my friends. We're talking to Del Barra. Take me back to growing up and what it was like in the household with a dad like Yogi Berra. You know, we grew up with his funny sayings. You know, I remember dad managing the mess, and me, Larry, and Timmy are watching the game on TV, and all of a sudden... Two streakers run out of the stands on TV and the camera flips away from them. So when he gets home, me, Larry, and Timmy say, hey, Dad, 
those streakers? What were they, boys or girls? We need to know. And Dad looked us right in the eye and said, I couldn't tell they had bags over their heads. <laughs> in a Mississippi minute. Be sure to check out In a Mississippi Minute with me, Steve Azar, right here on Super Talk Mississippi, the Super Talk Mississippi app, and now available on iTunes, Google Play, and Stitcher. This is Coast View with Ricky Matthews on Super Talk Mississippi Gulf Coast 103.1. Welcome back to Coast View. We're having a just an absolute memorable, com- memorable conversation with with uh, Apollo astronaut Fred Hayes. And uh, when we were when we went to to the break, we talked a little bit about the Apollo 13 movie. But you know, it's interesting if you look at the the people who starred in the movie. Obviously, the headliners: Tom Bank, uh, Hanks, Kevin Bacon, Bill Paxton, Ed Harris, Gary Sinise. I'm, I'm a fan of all those guys, but I'm I was particularly a fan of Bill Paxton. Just just was thought he did a great job playing you in the movie. Um, I loved his other movies. Really sad that he passed away. Did you have a relationship with him at all along the way? Uh, I, it was arranged uh, by Ron Howard. The second time he visited Kennedy, he brought the camera crew and uh, was uh, interested in picking out uh, w- locations for scenes he had in mind for the movie. But he brought along Bill Paxton and kind of handed him off to uh, to me. And I had arranged and took uh, Bill on a sort of a blue ribbon uh, uh, tour of Kennedy Space Center. He had, as a child uh, and even beyond, was not particularly that interested in the Space Center, uh, at least in any depth. I guess he followed the media, and that's about it. And so I took him on a tour mainly to influence him with shuttle operations that were going on at the time at the various facilities with the hangar where one was being uh, worked to get ready for the next launch and then out to the launch pad uh, to, con- to show him what was going on with the activity and uh, make him aware that uh, it wasn't as simple as just crawling in the vehicle and pushing a button. It took a lot of people, a lot of dedicated workers to uh, get things uh, turned around and ready to go again. And uh, by the sideline, I took him to the uh, newly finished uh, uh, space station building uh, where none of the hardware had arrived yet but the building was finished and one, one part of it had tunnels uh, so above ground where some of the uh, gaseous lines and electrical lines for some of the support equipment that would come up through the floor to test stations above and we got in that tunnel and he said uh, wow he said wow this is where I should have filmed aliens but, yeah. <laughs> but, but it, at any rate, Bill was a little afraid of playing my role. He worried, he said, he said he, because he had never played a live person. Uh, all his roles before had been fictional characters, or I guess uh, the shootout at the OK Corral, he, he played obviously a live person that but un- was long since deceased. So I would be the first uh, person that would be still alive, I guess, to critique his, uh, <laughs> how he played the role, and I told him not to worry about it. It was only uh, the mission was only six days. It wasn't a life story of Gandhi, and so I I had seen his some of his work uh, before in movies. I said, "You'll do fine." You know what's what's interesting about the movie, and we'll move on after this, is that it did in a way institutionalize the experience in ways that you know it's widely better understood what you guys experienced. Not that in the moment the, the entire world wasn't engaged in one way or the other. But uh, but going back to you know the, the you know you're, again you'll be November the, in November of this year you'll be 89 years old you've had this lifelong commitment to to education or science and math and children you're, you, in fact but when we were on break you told me about um, the the number of engagements that you're still involved in classrooms why don't you talk a little bit about that. Well, I, you know, as you grow older, you worry about, well, there's challenges ahead, and I talk about some of them in the book. And we need uh, bright young people to uh, grow up and be ready to take on those challenges uh, in various ways, either either in the politics and leadership or directly, as you mentioned, as uh, the actual scientists and engineers, because many of these, uh, technolo- these things will require technology to as part of the solution. Uh, so I, I became interested that way. And museums are, have been a good outlet around the country. I participate in many events at museums, some of them primarily for fundraising. 
because they're all not for profits, and that's a that's a part of the business to uh, keep alive is yes. to have a revenue source and uh, part of our events that museums hold galas gala type events, and of course been very intimate for now 16 years with the uh, development and uh, and growth of operating uh, Infinity Science Center uh, right uh, right at the first exit as you come into Mississippi on I-10 from Louisiana. So that's been kind of my biggest uh, museum uh, 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 challenge uh, that I, I was involved with, with to grow it, to get raise the money to build it and grow up. In fact, I'll be there this coming uh, Tuesday. I'll yeah. be driving over and I'll stop to take care of business. I have signings to do of various things that have been mailed in. And I'm mm. at Infinity uh, this coming Tuesday. That's so exciting. You know, you also mentioned that you're you've you've had the opportunity through, through Zoom to talk to kids around the world. Yeah, this like summer uh, Infinity has uh, sp uh, space camps, uh, astro camps they call, and I talked to I think four or five of those uh, this year. Uh, I do work with the education department at Johnson Space Center, where I live in Houston, so it's convenient. And for four years now, I've talked to a, a teacher group that comes in every year for all, about over a week uh, from science and math teachers from all around the country. And uh, so I've done that four years in a row. And uh, next week, I talk to uh, interns uh, that NASA has high school interns uh, uh, in a group next week, again, via Zoom call. So I, I continue to hopefully inspire them to uh, continue uh, really down the vein of life uh, and career that makes sense for the talent they have. I, I don't think everybody's suitable, maybe uh, with just the skills they've been blessed to be born with to become an engineer, but I hope they make the best use of whatever those skills are to get situated in a career path that will make the best use of those skills. And that's yeah. the thing everybody should strive for in life. It's, it's clear to me that, that when people speak of your legacy, it, it will be a lot around education for sure and your commitment to that. Listen, it has been a pleasure to have some opportunity, had this opportunity to visit with you today. Uh, you know, there's so much more we could have talked about, but you know what what amazes me is your your continued commitment to make to make to make a contribution, and that, as your mother said, you're not going to sit in a in a rocking chair, and uh, and uh, I think that that sets a, an incredible standard for others to follow. So anyway, God bless you, my friend. All right, thank you. I'm happy to have joined you today and enjoyed the great program. Yeah, thank you very much. It's been a, it's been a real pleasure. This has been Fred Hayes. Have a great day, and we will see you tomorrow. Follow Super Talk Mississippi Gulf Coast 103.1 on Facebook. Facebook.com slash Super Talk MS Coast 103.1.